Hi, I'm Josh Keegan and welcome to this episode of the Space Down Under Live. In this live stream we will be talking about the Australian space industry to try to provide some insights into what's been happening over the course of 2021. I'll be speaking with John Clark, the President of the Mars Society Australia, in just a few moments. For those of you who don't know, yes, we have our very own unique Mars Society Australia which is unique to this country, and it's linked to the Mars, larger Mars Society and is part of a worldwide group of all associations, all founded by Robert Zubrin in 1997. The Mars Society has links to almost every space agency in the world and boasts one of the most iconic members, Mr. Elon Musk. In this live episode, we'll be talking all about sovereign launch capability develop, being developed in Australia by Gilmore Space Technologies, Southern Launch, specifically at Whaler's Way, Black Sky Aerospace, and Equatorial Launch Alliance. We're also going to delve into satellite manufacturing, including Fleet Space and Spiral Blue. And lastly, we're going to go into other news in terms of education and Australia's first male and female commercial Aussie Nords. Now, as a reminder, there will be a Q&A towards the end of this live stream where you can ask all your questions. So we're just going to launch this off right now. And I'm going to say, welcome, John. Welcome to the Space Down Under live. And I think I muted you. <laughs> can you take yourself off mute? I'm sorry that you were, you were typing something. Yeah. Thanks, mate. I mean, this is, yeah, yeah, this is twice, so I'm beginning to get a feeling about this. <laughs> Sorry. I've, I've got some, for everyone who's following along at home, I've got some um, new software and all that sort of stuff. And one of the wonderful abilities that it lets me do is mute my guests. I can mute them. <laughs> I can't unmute them. So, yay! <laughs> software works when it does. So, welcome, John. Thanks very much for joining me and to discuss what's happening, been happening in the Australian space industry over the course of 2021. Um, and obviously, my apologies for last time uh, for delaying this episode because, as you might recall, I was actually sick last time. So, I'm sorry, everyone, that I actually had to delay it now. So, welcome, John. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, look, um, Mars is coming out. I've just heard um, in the last couple of days that Mars is coming out of solar conjunction. So we'll have another episode uh, to cover more about the red planet. But for the moment, um, you and I are almost twinsy. Twinsies wearing our Mars Society Australia uh, shirts, our polo tops. So <laughs> I thought it'd be most appropriate, especially when I'm hosting the president of the Mars Society Australia. So, all right. Um, so I'm just going to make sure that everyone has grabbed their favourite beverage um, or a cup of coffee or at least your favourite beverage. And let's make a start on what's happening in the Australian space industry. All right. Now, unfortunately, we have to talk about... Um, uh, one particular company in a little bit more detail because it doesn't matter where you look or where you go, you see them absolutely everywhere. And that is Gilmore Space. So we're going to talk, chat a little bit about Gilmore Space Technologies and how in June 2021, they actually received $61 million payday. Um, so a bit of a background um, first. So Gilmore Space um, we offered a ser Series C uh, round and w which, included, um, which included funding from U.S based structure, fine structure ventures, Australian capital firms such as Blackbird and Main Sequence, and Australian superannuation funds including HESTA, Host Plus, NGS Super, um, bringing the total funds, amount of funds raised for Gilmore Space Technologies to date to be $87 million. Um, this funding will be used for developing, I guess, the um, Eris three-stage rocket, which I believe is still under construction at Gilmore's factory on the Gold Coast. So, John, what do you think about that? What do you think about the first piece of news of um, Gilmore Space actually um, scoring $61 million in funding? Well, it's uh, well, good on them. I mean, I've uh, known uh, the Gilmore Brothers for a number of years now, and they're certainly uh, very diligent and, uh, and very hardworking. Hmm. And um, I think it's fantastic they've formed these partnerships and raised this money because, as someone said a long time ago, no bucks, no buck Rogers. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good analogy. I like yeah, that. Yeah. So uh, I think it was it was in the movie The Right Stuff, which was sort of back in the uh, back in the eighties. But um, you know, whatever you're doing in space, uh, particularly if you're building flight hardware or launch hardware, mm -hmm. uh, you really need serious money. And without yeah, that, yeah. Uh, you'll either never get anywhere or just take a very long time to do it. So yeah, good on them for achieving this. 
Yeah, correct. And just for, to remind everyone, um, in terms of this sort of stuff, uh, SpaceX actually um, would have been a completely and utterly broke in a similar situation if it wasn't for the funding that came through from the commercial uh, resupply um, missions that um, NASA was able to grant them. And that, just as a refresher, was $1.2 billion of NASA US funds. So that was quite a significant amount of, um, of money. So just remember that Gilmore is on that same path um, as SpaceX, I believe, um, and they needed some serious dollars to actually get them themselves kicked off to, to, to make sure that they're actually building the rockets. Um, it's not a, it's it's an expensive um, affair to actually get things done. So in other it, news, yeah. um, in fact, if I could just yep. make a comment on yeah, that. Absolutely. In fact, uh, the total total amount of taxpayers' money that SpaceX have received is uh, something like um, over eight billion dollars, enough wow. money to build a nuclear aircraft carrier. So they have um, uh, there'd be another struggling uh, aerospace company <laughs> without that sort of cash injection. Which which is good, but uh, um, uh, we, we've got to we've got to credit uh, the U.S. government for choosing to fund them. Uh, yeah, correct. otherwise there'd be nowhere. Yeah, exactly. And th that's the thing is that the, it all started with the commercial resupply um, uh, yeah. CRS commercial resupply. Anyway, can't remember the S stands for. Um, and that's the thing is that um, yeah, after they managed to win that contract, they've I know they've won more money, um, millions and hundreds of millions of dollars to ve develop um, launch integration, uh, vertical launch integration facilities. They've, um, they're, that's from the military. They've also received military funding for the Starship. So they've actually received quite a quite a bit. And eight billion dollars does not surprise me in the slightest. Um, but yeah, the first initial funds came from NASA. So hopefully with um, Gilmore Space, they'll be able to get um, a few more dollars. Um, um, with what they're doing. All right. In other news, also on Gilmore Space, unfortunately, um, or fortunately, whichever way you want to look at it, um, in May 2021, Gilmore Space Technologies has also expressed an interest in a small scale launch facility at Abbott Point on. Um, at, in Bowen on Queensland's north coast. Um, in 2020, um, the reason why this came about was that in 2020, the Queensland government commissioned a technical and environmental study on Abbott Point's potential as a launch location. So Abbott Point, for everybody who who's playing along at home, um, that's uh, on Queensland's north coast. It's up around Townsville, so I think I've got an image of it here. Yeah, so it's, it sits around about halfway um, down the Queensland coast, it, like in total area so um, they're looking to develop a small um, launch facility there um, for s small scale rockets um, but however there is some um, interesting news that that's coming up a little bit later that I'll talk about in terms of what they're trying to do as well so um, look in terms of um, developing a launch facility it, it what needs to happen is um, SpaceX uh, well the Sorry, let me go back a little bit. NASA actually had the advantage of getting a lot of funding for the US uh, moon program. And with all that money that they had, which was around, around about 1% of GDP or something like that, um, way back in the 50s and 60s, when they were finally going for the race, um, they were able to um, basically build uh, multiple, multiple, multiple uh, launch pads and multiple facilities, including vertical integration, all that sort of stuff. So, with, And that was all um, from NASA and government support way back then so Australia by comparison we don't actually have launch pads um, they haven't been built yet so um, this is the first iteration or the one of the many iterations of launch facilities that are currently being built on right around the country um, all right so John what did you think about that well I think it's uh, yeah all of this is good all is exciting um, I think uh, one problem with Abbott Point though it is actually a major uh, port Yep. Uh, export export uh, port for bulk commodities, and um, I don't know how compatible that would be with um, uh, large scale launching because obviously um, uh, ship movements uh, would have to be uh, you know, any, any kind of launch would have to have a no a no tam for and a shutting down of air and sea traffic around it. Um, so uh, it'll be interesting to see how that works out. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and the other thing that I, I thought was really interesting about this whole whole thing that um, Gilmore Space is doing, and, and it's fantastic and good on them for actually doing it, is the my concern is, oops, sorry, I went, went, went ahead. I'll go back a little bit. So if we just look off the, um, the actual coast of 
that side off the coast of Queensland, um, there is actually something that's significant that runs down the coast of Queensland, not very far off, around about um, 50 to 70 kilometres off the coast of Queensland. And that's the Great Barrier Reef. And last time I checked, that's um, a heritage listed site um, or a globally listed um, world environmental site. Um, so yeah, this environmental study that's being done, I'm, I'm interested to see, to know that they've still come back and said, look, it's it's okay for you to launch. Um, maybe it's to do with, to do with the trajectory <laughs> I'm having a moment trajectory um, of the rocket and what they were able to put forward so yeah I, I, I'm i concerned but you know if the government has gone through and said it's okay then it, you know, I kind of think it might be alright Have they released the uh, environmental impact statement yet? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, often, mm. I, before uh, before this, I was looking around for those sorts of things like environmental impact statements, mm. all that sort of stuff. So I'm just mm. I'm just assuming that um, that they're looking. The, the Queensland government has done its due diligence and actually had mm. a good look into it. Mind you, though, in that particular in those particular areas, off other locations off the Queensland coast, there are there are mines and then, um, uh, like coal mining and all that sort of stuff where they mm. eject um, some of the the um, the uh, wastewater off those straight uh, which goes into a river and then goes over to the great barrier reef so uh <clears throat> um yeah, yeah i mean um, the impact of, of of depends on the number of launches i mean the yeah, impact correct. of a, a small number of small launches is, is trivial compared to uh all sorts of other things that are happening there and the barrier reef at that point is a long way offshore yeah correct. Uh, so yeah we'll we'll see what happens yep Absolutely, and look, what I, from what I've heard um, and what I know is that uh, at this particular point in time, the, uh, Gilmore Space is looking to launch its Eris uh, rocket, the three-stage rocket that I was talking about earlier. They're looking to launch that in mid-2022. As far as I understand, um, from what I've heard, they are still on track to do so. Um, and it, like every other company, they've actually been impacted by um, border closures for COVID-19 and all that sort of stuff. Um, so there, that actually, because yeah, in a, for those of you following along internationally um, and my apologies I should explain that so one of the things that Australia has done um, between our each individual states is we've actually shut the borders preventing um, ongoing travel of uh, a, a free travel between the states um, so at the moment the Queensland has been more or less locked down and people from New South Wales can't travel freely any longer um, that's okay um, simply because what it's done for Queensland at least speaking for Queen as a Queenslander only is um, <clears throat> We've only had a few minor lockdowns. Our cases of COVID-19 are very, very low. Um, and we've only, at the moment, we've only got a mask restriction, which is every every time we go outside, we must have a mask on. And that's about it. So it ha COVID-19 hasn't really impacted us very much, luckily. And the um, Delta variant hasn't impacted Queensland nearly as much as what it has for other states. So I'll just point that out. However, closing the border and making it so that you actually have to have a passport, not a passport, permission to go across the border, all that sort of stuff, and the Queensland police check and the New South Wales police check is that um, it actually is restricting goods going across uh, the Queens between Queensland and New South Wales. So this is a new paradigm for all of Australia. Um, we've never actually had closed borders before. It's, it's not like our borders have actually had informed on them um, and this is a first for us so yeah um, very unusual but it, it, we I certainly understand from my perspective why they've done it so yeah just explain that and probably over explain it like I normally do <laughs> all right let's press right along um, so lastly um, uh, oh, so there's the actual um, uh, mock-up of what the uh, small launch site will look like. I just want to point that out. Um, the Queensland government released these images, um, I believe, uh, with the the Aeros rocket already sitting there. So I've just gone, well, Queensland government's been a little bit presumptive. <laughs> However, it has worked because um, Gilmore Space is now um, looking at launching from the location anyway. So it worked out for the Queensland government. All right, so lastly, um, pressing right along. Um, uh, Gilmore Space is leading the push for a, a, leading the push for a group of around 30 companies to develop the Australian Space Manufacturing Network, which includes support from both Boeing and Airbus. So, what the AM, AMSN aims to do is establish three new space facilities in Queensland. So, one of them will be a common test and manufacturing facility, enabling members to advance their space research and technology development at a lower cost, obviously, to an advanced manufacturing facility for the building of commercial rockets and satellites, which will all be anchored by Gilmore Space, 
and three, an orbital spaceport at Abbott Point We're near Bowen in North Queensland that will help bring many of these products to space. So there you go. So <laughs> even though it's a small launch facility that the Queensland government is putting in, um, look, and yes, I understand that um, that it could be a limited amount of launches or small rockets, um, all that sort of stuff. However, um, that third statement actually makes me wonder exactly how many launches they're potentially looking to do from Abbott Point longer term. All right, moving along. Whoop, hang on, sorry. Um, just to hit live, sorry, I went one too far. <laughs> Oh dear. So Gilmore Space has also done one last thing, which is they've also, earlier this year, uh, they conducted a second, a 10 second test of their flight engine. Um, and that was conducted only uh, last month. So it's October now, it's September, 2021. Um, and what they did is they uh, successfully did that. According to what they were saying on their website, it is a flight engine. So I'll just show you what that looks like. impressive i saw mark diamonds and everything that's the sort of thing that gets this rocket nerd really excited <laughs> so have you seen any of the any of those sorts of things yet john uh, no no i'm uh, so i was wondering what sort of thrust uh, they were getting out of it and uh, whether this was their um, uh, hybrid rocket uh, engine yeah. that they were working on or whether this was a uh, full liquid fuel one no, um, this is, uh, from what I know and understand, they're still going full tilt with the um, hybrid rocket engine, which is actually mm -hmm. using a um, uh, inert, uh, well, I can't even remember what it is, but it's it's using liquid oxygen and uh, uh, um, it'd be something else. Um, it, advanced mm -hmm. manufacturing techniques to get the inert fuel to actually burn. Um, but yes, they're still actually pursuing the hybrid rocket engine, which is more or less a solid rocket engine, um, but with a um, liquid ox, I guess a, not even a liquid oxygen. Yeah, liquid oxygen. Yeah, liquid oxygen. To, yeah. yeah, to actually make sure it actually burns uh, rapidly and hard. So um, I did one of these before um, in uh, an earlier video on um, the Aeris rocket. Um, it's supposed to have a, imp a specific impulse of around about 328 seconds when fully loaded um so yeah it actually has the orbital capability from um from previous research i've done into it so um and they also conducted a, a 90 sec uh, i think it was a 90 second or 110 second um test as well um and that was quite significant and that um happened uh, last year so that was the in uh, 2020 mm. all right um so moving right along southern launch um, so just to give you a bit of an idea, um, Southern Launch is based in Adelaide, South Australia, and they made international news in 2020 when they launched two rockets to an altitude of 85 kilometers. Uh, the rocket used was a two-stage vehicle called DART, and DART was weighed in at 34 kilos and 3.4 meters in length. The pay payload in this instance weighed in this instance weighed less than 500 grams. Um, and since this time, Southern Launch has actually you know, done a few things. They haven't sat on their laurels since last year. So just to give you an idea, Southern Launch has also completed a, a rocket launch facility at Whaler's Way in um, South Australia. Um, and you can see it there on the map. It's just out, um, uh, past Port Lincoln. Um, so it's right down there on the, on the bottom point tip. Um, so with that one, um, they completed that in South Australia and they attempted to launch the rocket that you see there. Um, that's not an animation, that's actually the rocket standing on the pad. That's called um, High, pa High Path 1 from Taiwan, Taiwan's very own Thai space. Um, that unfortunately, uh, uh, I'll, I'll go with who Thai Space are, sorry. Um, Thai Space was actually founded in 2016 by a group of investors, scientists, and engineers led by uh, Yen San Chen, who had previously worked at the NSPO and NASA's Marshall uh, Space Flight Center. 
um, and the and unfortunately the VS01 as it was called was unable to launch experiencing a fire on the pad um, which actually damaged the engine so that rocket sat on the pad for a while it was delayed by um, upper level winds um, which is the curse of many 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 launches um, and then in the end there was a, there, there, there was a fire that occurred at the engine that actually prevented the launch in the end and um, as you can see on screen there's a bit of a statement there from Lloyd Damp the CEO of Southern Launch um, mentioning all about what happened um, with that that uh, in terms of what, what um, Southern Launch was able to gain from it was a lot of data um, on vibration on actually successfully um, firing a rocket engine on their pad all that sort of stuff um, as a secondary note, um, there was a lot of protests at the time, um, just when they were attempting to launch the uh, VSO-1 or the um, High Path-1, um, and that was from environmental groups and everything like that. Um, an environmental assessment was already done, as John and I have talked about um, in the past, and an environmental assessment was done. However, um, there were uh, at that particular point in time, there were whales in the bay, and the, the um, locals were quite um, upset about the fact that the rocket could upset the whales um, so it, to their um, to their credit absolute credit um, Southern Launch has decided to take all that on board and is moving the rocket pad from its current location to somewhere that's a little bit more environmentally stable and it's not it's not going to um, upset as many locals or they hope any thoughts on that John um, yeah um, <laughs> it's, it's a bit, it's a bit it. outside my comfort zone but but um, look, again, um, there are so many people working in this space. Mm. Uh, I suppose I have a little bit of caution. Uh, for most, uh, in most places, the money to be made in the space sector is actually in the payloads and providing services. It's great to see people working on rockets. It's very glamorous. But in fact, it's providing satellites. Uh, and also the services on the day the satellites return that are in fact the most profitable. So mm. uh, I hope we don't get too many people uh, investing in launch services uh, because uh, uh, there's a very high chance of failure there and often not a lot of return. Uh, SpaceX struggles to make money, for example. Yeah, um, I, 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 I understand, but you, you're not going to like yeah. the rest of this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to sort of... Um, you know, rain on anyone's parade, but I think um, uh, it would be good to see a lot of uh, you know, diversity across all the all the fields, as well as just focusing on launch uh, launch services. Yeah, I, I look and I, I honestly believe, and this is a personal opinion, of course, um, is that because it's been so long since Australia has actually had our own sovereign launch capability. Mm -hmm. Like the last time we did it was in 1967, and um, mm -hmm. yeah, so there's a, actually a bit more of a um, uh, similar to SpaceX that we are able to do it first and so whoever that falls to is a, uh, whichever company that falls to they can always lay claim to having returning Australia into the the space 2.0 um, so I think that's why it's um, there, there's a lot of people focused on actually launching um, and as I said the, the rest of this presentation is not going to go very well <laughs> because it is no no good. look it, it's all it's all great to see but uh, oh, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, I, I understand, but it, 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 there'll be that there'll be that thing where there'll be a lot of investment, like like anything, there'll be a lot of investment in the the new, the fantastic, and the upcoming, mm -hmm. and then eventually it'll all equalize and normalize, and then there'll be um, one or two companies, I believe, in the end that'll come out on top. They'll be mm -hmm. providing exclusive launch services in Australia, and and that'll be it. Um, so. It's, Speaking of launch services, we continue on. Um, so we go now to Black Sky Aerospace. So I've covered Black Sky Aerospace in episode one of the Space Down Under Live. Um, and I did cover um, in a lot of detail of what they're up to in 2020. Uh, there was quite a bit, so I'm not going to cover it all again, simply because it was last year and we're trying to, I'm trying to focus on what's happening this year. Um, so even though that... Um, Black Sky Aerospace has actually been very quiet for most of this year. Suddenly, all of us, um, they've actually started to do some things, especially last month. So there seems to be a bit of a pattern here in seasons running in Australia where everybody remains, does announcements in the beginning of the year, then they actually start to roll out hardware around about September, October. So um, for me, this is um, really, really interesting. So um, so in September this year, the, the, it's a Queensland company again. So yay, Queensland. Um, they received $678,487 to build a responsive 
common use booster, so RCUB, uh, for the commercial use under the Australian Space Agency. Now, this is actually part of a grant that was actually goes towards NASA's Moon to Mars initiative. Um, there was also a successful static fire of a new motor, which we can see pictured here, um, a next generation rocket, sorry, I apologize. Um, and unfortunately, if with this one, um, all I've got is that one picture and it's terrible. Um, it, because there's been little news about, uh, mm. even from Black Sky Aerospace, I've reached out and tried to ask what's going on, what the engine is being developed for. Um, I'm not even sure what the rocket motor might be for, whether or not it's for orbital capability, all that sort of stuff. Um, so I'm not sure where they're going with this. So again, at the same time, Black Sky Aerospace is also um, looking to um, launch their own uh, rocket, which has been designed and built right here in Australia. And unfortunately, they had to scrub as well. Um, so it's not um, scrub timber. So it's yeah, well, scrub timber. There you go. Um, it, it was the first uh, the first one was a uh, first launch attempt was actually scrubbed due to upper level winds. So again, um, something that impacts most of the space industry. Um, and then unfortunately, technical issues were encountered with the rocket itself. So um, hopefully we'll get to hear more about this one again soon. But um, yeah, it's, um, it's uh, one of the couple of the things that happen in Australia in terms of the um, Australian space industry, uh, unless you're actually um, close inside the company or um, you know someone inside the company, which I'm also trying to do, um, you hear very little publicly about what they're up to and what they're trying to do, all that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, John, do you know anything about Black Sky and what they're up to? Um, do you know anybody at the company I could possibly talk to? <laughs> Look, uh, sadly, no. I mean, they, they do have their supporters out there. Yeah. Um, and um, again, you know, it, it's good to see them getting money. Um, it's it's starting small and uh, and getting it to work at a small scale and then uh, and then scaling up. That's uh, that's the challenge. Um, it's good that all of these companies have got achievable goals. They're not sort of saying, "Oh, well, we're going to be putting." 50 tons in orbit in the next, uh, in the next <laughs> yeah. year uh, they're actually uh, looking at goals that are achievable uh, given the level of funding available so that's uh, uh, that's encouraging yes it is and we're still on the sovereign launch um, capability bit because we're now going to cover um, the last one which is equatorial launch australia now um I'm going to say this for the longest time. Um, now, this is just from my perspective, and I've 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 known people in in the actual company, all that sort of stuff, and they have been ridiculously quiet about this. Um, apart from that, they're going to they were going to be doing something with NASA, and I'm not sure what what that was going to be. Um, suddenly, Equatorial Launch Australia, or ELA, as their logo is there, has suddenly taken the covers off what it's attempting to do with. Um, building an orbital launch pad in Dullumbai in the Northern Territory. They have moved from nothing more, what you see on screen, which is a computer render, to actual um, potential launch pad. And they've um, started to physically build it to what it actually looks to be. Um, and looks to be, um, based on the computer render, multiple launch pads. So they're not building one, they're building multiples. Um, so they've even produced a video um, that has actually ha gained the support of the space Australian Space Agency and the head of the Australian Space Agency, Enrico Paramero, and it also features representatives from NASA. Behind us is a 40-foot launch rail from the main bits of kit that NASA have been here putting in place, around 30 to 40 ongoing local jobs of Goomuch and other subbies to make this a reality. Now, it's gonna be about four or five weeks worth of construction this year. Then obviously next year, around June, July, we're gonna have about 80 NASA people on site for the launch process. We want to see Boy have a secure future post mining. Space is a big part of that. This is just the start for us. We intend for this to be the premier commercial multi-user launch site in the world. In our civil space strategy, uh, access to space is a key priority area. We have wide open ranges, we have ranges like this one that are on the ocean, uh, can-do attitudes, stable geopolitical climate. It's aligned with that purpose for growing uh, a thriving uh, space sector here in Australia. This has been a long time in the making uh, for NASA and we've been working at this for over a decade, uh, trying to get back to Australia. For my, my plan, it's a step towards the future of you know, poor people. We not only employ our own people, but whole much, 
we opened, opened doors for other people on the homeland. We followed the stars to our destinations. We've got to grab our opportunities post-COVID. It is incredibly exciting to have uh, NASA here in the NT. So, um, yeah, with that one, John, um, yeah, I, th this one is what makes me really, really proud um, is that with all this sort of stuff that um, that ELA, um, and let me just give credit to everyone, um, not only ELA, but the Southern Launch, um, Southern Launch, um, the Equatorial Launch Alliance, uh, sorry, Australia, um, and Abbott Point um, with Gilmore Space, they are do, do actually creating a lot for um, Indigenous um, communities, which have been largely ignored in this country for a while. Um, they have been uh, taken care of in various ways, um, but not nearly as what they can, whereas the new approach seems to be engaging with um, the Indigenous population or Indigenous communities first um, to actually look at creating jobs that they can benefit from immediately, which is what something I'm very, very proud of. Okay. All right. Yeah. No, go on. Do you know, um, do ELA have plans beyond the initial uh, sounding rocket program, which is what they're going to be doing with, uh, with NASA? Oh, look, I, I, again, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And I hate doing that is that, um, yeah, look, uh, uh, from what I've heard and from what, from the, the graphics and from what I've heard and everything like that, yes, uh, ELA mm -hmm. is looking to develop more than just one launch pad. Um, yes, they're mm -hmm. looking to develop something more than just the sounding rockets. Um, and I think it, it, it um, from Southern Launch and bringing in Thai Space, which was a, which was a startup, um, then I think they'll, uh, once they, the philosophy seems to be, yes, yeah, start small, um, offer something, but it's, um, it's also, if you build it, they will come. Um, it seems to be the sort of attitude that's going on at the moment. So hopefully with any luck, there'll be more, there'll be more companies or space companies, um, they'll be interested in at least flying their rockets from Australia. Because one thing we have over the rest of the world is we have large open skies. We have very little air traffic in, in specific locations. You're not going to be interrupting commercial flight paths. You're not going to be interrupting um, the only thing you might be interrupting is weather balloons at those, those sorts of heights. And then after you pass the Kármán line, then um, the Civil Aviation and Safety Authority in Australia doesn't care anymore. Um, and then it becomes a, um, an international problem once you actually hit there. So um, so that's, that's what I think, the attraction for a lot of companies uh, worldwide to actually potentially launch from Australia. However, whether or not we, those companies will actually be able to benefit from that, I, I, just, I just don't know. I can't say at this point. All right, so we're going to change over to something a little bit more in, in regard to rather than just being uh, launch capability, because as everyone can see, we're actually well and truly on our way to having our own sovereign launch capability. Um, and it looks like it will be from multiple locations. Um, so we're going to switch over to manufacturing now. And the first one is, which has been on screen while I was talking to John just then, is Fleet Space. So Fleet Space Technologies has also been awarded um, money from the Australian government's Moon to Mars Supply Chain um, Capability Improvement Grant. It's a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> and they've received uh, $386,770. I know it seems small, but this sort of money does actually go a long way once the government contributes. Um, and the, that money will be used to improve the capability of the high, hybrid satellite low powered wide area network. <laughs> um, uh, Fleet Space has also signed a contract with Gilmore Space Technologies to launch its satellites to orbit in 2023. Uh, the launches will be completed on Gilmore's Ares rocket, which you actually saw there before. Um, and it'll be the first time a, a, a Australian satellites, Australian built satellites will be launched on an Australian rocket um, right from our own soil. Um, so that's um, s some other news that's been happening there. So spa uh, Fleet Space Technologies has a history of launching hardware to orbit, and it actually started um, launching its own um, first nanosats in back all the way back in 2018. Uh, moving on, uh, we'll go to Spiral Blue. Um, now, I've already uh, covered this in a little bit of detail um, in terms of, um, I've done a video on it with um, Tofik Huck, the CEO of Spiral Blue. Now, Spiral Blue is a small startup that it, um, hitched a ride on the very first launch of Tubular Bells. 
um, on the 30th of June 2021 with Virgin Orbit. Um, so that's where um, Virgin is actually decided to strap a rocket to underneath underneath a 747, modify, heavily modified 747 in the spare engine bay and um, launched that successfully to orbit. It was the first successful commercial launch. Um, so Spiral Blue is looking to take uh, edge computing into space uh, to actually process images on orbit before sending them back to Earth. The whole aim of Spiral Blue is to democratize these images from space, making them so cheap that anyone across in any country can actually access the images. And what I spoke with Tofik about was mainly he was looking that um, anybody from, he was from India and anybody from India, um, including the poorer rural communities could possibly access and get access to these images. Um, funnily enough, Spiral Blue is also one of the 30 companies that's going to be joining Gilmore Space's Australian Space Manufacturing Network. <laughs> so, um, yeah, again, all roads seem to lead back to Gilmore Space. Okay, um, moving right along. So we've got other news um, that's happened. Um, now, yes, I understand that, um, that um, I might be missing a few things here, so um, that's uh, there is a lot that happens, and so um, I'm just trying to focus on the bigger things. So believe it or not, um, we actually have had our very first commercial Aussie Nort. So uh, Dr. Chris, I'm going to get this right, Boussian, Bu Bu Boussian? Yeah, I don't know, um, has become Australia's first commercial Aussie Nort, um, launching on the second Blue Origin flight. It was carrying William Shatner over the Carmen line, and that's him there. So uh, doc, uh, Dr. Chris Bosian, sorry, Bosian, Bosian, uh, is the founder of, of Planet Labs and has received his degrees from the University of Sydney. Now, Planet Labs has changed the game in orbital imaging uh, and is able to provide daily images of our changing world um, on an ongoing basis. So the other person that you see there is Kim Ellis Hayes. So Kim Ellis Hayes is due to become Australia's first female Aussie Nord, and she's due to launch as a payload specialist on Virgin Galactic sometime in 2023. Um, and since this announcement um, in August 2021, Virgin Galactic um, has actually was grounded, unfortunately, by the Federal Aviation Authority or the FAA in the United States um, for moving out of the designated flight path on its first commercial flight carrying Sir Richard Branson yeah, not the best thing to do. <laughs> um, so there's a there's a lot of controversy around that. So I'll, I'll leave you guys at home to to look that one up because um, I don't want to get into it. It starts to get messy. Um, so Virgin Galactic has since rectified the situation with its flight um, w over its flight and its flight paths and um, with the FAA. However, is actually now going announced a major upgrade program to its spaceships Unity and Eve, meaning the launches will be delayed to the fourth quarter of. 2022. So hopefully, fingers crossed, um, Kim's flight will still happen in 2023. <laughs> so what do you think, John? Do you ever ever think you'll get a chance to be an Aussie Nort? Well, it'd be nice, but uh, no, look, if William Shatner can do it at 90, you know, there's hope for all of us. Um, <laughs> it, look, it's been very disappointing, the la uh, both the, the really appalling coverage of uh, William Shatner's flight and a complete lack of interest in the fact there was uh, someone with an Australian connection on board by uh, the mainstream media. Yeah. I mean, you really have to look, uh, look pretty hard, discover that there is an Australian connection. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing is I, I looked and I looked hard and I found it by mistake. And I'm like, oh, OK, um, how did the how on earth did that happen? Um, and look, look, um, and I'll extend the offer, offer here publicly and live to everybody. Um, look, if Dr. Chris wants to actually speak to someone in depth and in detail who would love to talk to you about becoming an Aussie Nort, <laughs> hit me up, mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear talk about a shameless plug jesus oh anyway um so yes it, it was actually very limited coverage and i'm i was a little bit disappointed to that i had to go digging to actually find that one because the the sheer um stellar power of william shatner going to orbit was was what overshadowed everything else um and he would and believe it or not dr chris was i'll call him dr chris because i can't pronounce his last name is uh, he actually paid he was actually a paying customer. And again, that wasn't, hasn't been largely covered by Australian mainstream media. Um, and I find that a little bit interesting. Um, wouldn't you like a little bit of celebration if you were the, one of Australia's first Aussie Nords? To, well, commercial I think Aussie so. 
And of course, Planet Lab is a is a major space company offering uh, global uh, satellite imagery services. So uh, you know, he's he's just not some sort of random celebrity. He, he is someone who whose life is in dedicated to uh, to space activities. So uh, uh, it's a fantastic opportunity for yeah. him that he actually went up there. Exactly. And I mean, that's the thing is, it's also the, the ability to see exactly what his satellites have been imaging for years. And it's like, uh, I just don't understand why he ha why more of a fuss hasn't, hasn't been made in the um, in the mainstream media. However, I'm not mainstream media. That's why I exist on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> because I can say whatever I like. Yeah. All right. Of course, um, if, you put up, if you put up a football player or a tennis player, then it'll, that would be big news. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Good point. But I, I maybe, maybe the star power of William Shatner overshadowed. I don't know. Yeah potentially anyway all right so continuing on with one with um, other news in terms of what's happening in australia we'll go to one giant leap um so one giant leap australia foundation sent golden wattle seeds to the international space station with the help of jaxa which is a japan aerospace exploration agency the seeds were in space for around about seven months and they've since been distributed to more than 300 locations around australia so look i'm not going to go into too much detail in, in regard to this because i've chatted with um Jackie Carpenter, the founder of One Giant Leap Australia and an early episode of the Space Down Under Live. And I can say in terms of getting kids excited and interested in space and STEM, then One Giant Leap is one of those places you should definitely frequently check out and support if you can, simply because I know that she is doing magnificent things in terms of um, trying to get kids interested. She is more or less operating on a shoestring um, and it's in the, you know the, she's got real she's got real things happening in space including sending the waddle seeds um so john um the waddle seeds um have you put in your order for some <laughs> no, no we've got enough waddles in our garden already all oh, right well that's the other thing is my wife my wife is highly allergic to um that sort of pollen so <laughs> no oh, chance dear. for me so yeah, unless, unless, of course, I want a quick, uh, quickie divorce. Anyway, all right, so that's it. Um, so that's what, what we've covered in the Australian space industry. So now is the opportunity for everyone to ask their questions. Um, you may have um, have you may have about anything we've discussed here. Um, so now is your chance to um, ask those questions. I've got them up on screen, the live feed. So um, I'm just going to go back through it and have a bit of a look. There was a lot of welcome um, to uh, the... Hang on, I don't, can I scroll that one? No, I can't. Anyway, there was a lot of wel um, welcome. I was chatting a lot to begin with while um, the music was playing, simply to make sure everything was working. Um, because, yeah, I've gone live before without actually going live. Um, so, yes, guys, if you have any questions, um, apparently the right stuff, John, is 1983. Um yeah. The right stuff. Yep. No Buck, yes. no Buck Rogers is where it comes yes. from. Yes. Um, what, ba what bag can happen? Uh, horizontal range. Read everything is okay. Uh, have a horizontal range. Okay. Lonely Interstellar. I'm not sure what you meant by that Lonely Interstellar. Um, I think it was in referring to John, the um, Gilmore space being right really close to the reef. Um, then we actually uh, passport to cross zones in your own country. Uh, yeah, that's what the COVID restrictions that they, um, we were talking about. And if, if people have had a bit of a discussion about that. Look, um, and I'll say to you, Lonely Interstellar, in, in, Lonely Interstellar the, the way that the governments, of a, the way the state governments, um, we have three um, levels of government in Australia. We have federal, um, state and local. Um, so the state governments, which is the one in the middle that controls the state. Yes, um, in we've actually had to lock down the borders so queensland between queensland and new south wales and victoria um, those borders were more or less closed um, there have been restrictions to south australia as well as into the northern territory uh simply because and to western australia and tasmania of course as well uh yes. the reason the reason don't why, forget western australia <laughs> yeah don't forget western australia shut the border sorry yeah. <laughs> if anyone wants to know if anyone wants to know what that is check out jimmy reese anyway he's really funny he's done a very funny australian guy on YouTube, it's done a very funny take on all that sort of stuff. So, and the reason why was they were acting on the best knowledge um, that they had at the time, um, which was to try and uh, sh shut the borders um, and l try and lock the virus out um, as much as possible. It has worked. It did work in New South Wales and Victoria for a very long time, and then it's it went to the point where it started to not. Um, just by comparison, um, uh, New South Wales and Victoria are the only ones that um, have experienced long uh, lockdown delays and long stay-at-home orders. Um, 
Queensland, we've been more or less free to wander, to walk around and go back to work and all that sort of stuff where some of us were working from home. Um, same with South Australia, same with um, uh, Western Australia and the Northern Territory. And I believe um, Tasmania is ex exactly the same as well. So the, re the reason why that happened is because we're just trying to um, limit the um, amount of people wandering around to stop the spread of the virus, to which means that there are less influx to people in ICUs, um, all that sort of so intensive care units, um, which could overwhelm our health system as all we need to do is look to the United States and see what happened um, when restrictions weren't in place. Um, and that's that's why that's why they did it, um, I believe. Uh, so we experienced that. Uh, sounding rockets don't reach orbit though. Will they aim for space eventually? Uh, Corinna, yes, um, they will aim for space. I believe that's in, in terms of uh, Equatorial Launch Australia. Um, uh, and as John rightly asked, yes, I, I gather that if you're building, building, sorry, if you're building all of those facilities, um, then you're looking for to go to or, orbit eventually out of, out of all of that. Um, so yes, I believe that's what they're trying to do. Um, it's worth noting. It's worth noting, yeah, Josh, absolutely. that some. Some sounding rockets do go up a very long way, over a thousand kilometres. So they uh, um, they have a very specific uh, objective, yep. um, and uh, they do do get well out into space. And of course, by the time we go to that altitude, yep. they've got to time them very very carefully to uh, avoid running into something that's already up there. Whereas the ones that just stay, uh, so go up to about a hundred kilometres or so, of course, are um, uh, there's less traffic control issues. Yeah, so there, and that's the thing is the the um, the sounding rockets actually can go almost as high as the International Space Station, but because they don't actually have enough orbital velocity to remain up there, then they yeah. then they slowly fall back. So yeah, the sounding rockets, even though it doesn't sound like it's going to do very much, yes, will actually reach orbit, um, but it will reach reach past the carbon line, but won't reach orbit because they don't have enough um, uh, specific impulse to actually uh, round out the orbit, all that sort of stuff. So yes. Um, any other questions? Um, Lonely Interstellar. I'm just looking through these guys. Uh, yeah, sure. Why did they East Coast, not the West Coast of Australia? Just a choice of anything uh, geographic. Oh, yeah. Why are they launching from um, from Eastern Australia, not Western Australia? That's actually a really good question. Um, and it has to do with the rotation of the Earth. <laughs> um, so what happens is if you launch from the east coast of Australia, then basically you're launching with the rotation of the Earth. Um, and what that means is it, it takes um, less fu uh, fuel to actually get to a, a to an orbit. Um, so that's why the east and the coast. Now, the west coast, there is nothing wrong with launching from there because, believe it or not, the west coast of Australia, it just goes over land. But pretty much there's nothing out there. Um, is there anything specific? No, I don't believe so. Um, why, why haven't they done that yet? I don't know. I couldn't actually um, answer that question. But yes, you make a valid point. Um, they could absolutely launch from the western part of Australia. Oh, western Australia. Yeah. Historically, for example, back in the, um, in the 50s, uh, when uh, the British were testing out their listing missile program, they, uh, they launched from South Australia. But their longest range was uh, in a northwesterly direction, uh, right across Western Australia. In fact, uh, all the way across the Indian Ocean to a target area that was uh, just off the coast of in international waters, just off the coast of what is now Yemen. Yeah. Um, so it certainly did launch in that direction. But of course, there it was a ballistic missile test. It wasn't a um, right. uh, it was an attempt at orbital flights. The orbital flights from Woomera were launched in the northeasterly direction. Um, yeah, exactly. They were in northeastly direction. So the got a question for you, John, um, which is it's, it's not really specifically to me or you, but I'll get you to answer it. Any thoughts on the South Korean launch, rocket launch recently? Well, yeah. I mean, everybody wants to get into it. I mean, they've had a long history. They've had a long history um, uh, working on on launches. They have used um, uh, some uh, Russian technology. They've collaborated with uh, with Russia in developing uh, joint rockets, some which have been launched from South Korea. Um, now they seem to uh, want to do it themselves. I mean, we we see of South Korea as a very small country, but uh, uh, it's uh, a very uh, well developed country. And um, like other countries, well developed countries like you know like Israel um, and uh, other European European countries, um, they're they're developing their own sovereign launch capability. Yeah, 
and and that's the thing is that it, it's it's it seems to be and and this is I'm, I'm not saying this is the flavor at the moment but it's it seems to be the commercial um uh, our onus at the moment is that there's it seems to be a focus on commercial launch capability um which is to invite companies from right around the world to, to do that sort of stuff and yes as you said, said rightly so john they're absolutely building on a massive massive history of of launches and things like that from by other countries um but yeah to do it themselves um yeah it's it's fantastic yeah. what, a, what a great opportunity um and if if they have any problems with north korea i know a country that's got really clear skies it's geopolitically stable they could possibly launch in <laughs> so, yeah i think you're right though the south korea also is very interested in in uh, developing their own military uh yeah. military launch capability probably yeah very yeah, uh, very short notice yeah. um uh, responsive launch capability which is um, um sadly uh, has less civilian application not entirely none but it is primarily military yeah um, we've got another one is um, from Lonely Interstellar. Um, what is Gilmore planning to launch? Um, the Ares rocket, um, which is a three-stage um, uh, orbital rocket um, that will be quite quite large. It's got um, three stages, so it, it will reach orbit. Um, the other question uh, he asked as well is um, indigenous satellites. So what do you think, John? Do you actually think that the indigenous communities will get to develop their own satellites and build their own satellites? Um, well, uh, certainly Australia is developing uh, an indigenous uh, satellite construction, as in Australian-based satellite. Uh, satellite well, um, I think he means um, indigenous program. communities. Yeah. In terms of uh, yeah, the indigenous population of Australia, um, uh, it would be very good to see uh, schools with uh, large uh, indigenous numbers of indigenous students perhaps getting involved in launching their own sat or, or building their own satellites as, as has happened in other countries yeah. um, whether there are specific um, issues uh, for australians indigenous population that could be specifically addressed by their own satellite uh, i think that remains to be seen but yeah i'll, I'll be happy happy oh. to prove wrong with this yeah, me too. I'd, I'd love to see in, uh, like local indigenous communities actually build their own satellite um, and develop the develop the skills and technical capability in house yeah. themselves to actually do that. I'd love to see a, an indigenous community um, start up. So look, uh, I, th I think that's all the questions there, John. So um, look, thanks very much to you very much for joining me. Um, for this particular episode, uh, talking all about um, the um, the Australia's space industry. Look, we certainly have covered a, a lot of topics. We've covered our uh, covered mm -hmm. silver launch, and we've covered manufacturing, and we've also covered the other initiatives that are happening in the Australian space industry. So, for anybody who wants to know, <laughs> and I'm going to say it again, and I'll endlessly say it because I'm passionate about it, is the we have an Australian space industry we always have it's been there it's not going away and it's now actually starting to really really heat up so look thanks very much for your time there john look and um look, I'll let thank you, you. so thanks very much for your time um and for everybody else i'll just let you let you everybody whoops i don't know what's happening there oops oh that seems to have gone weird i'm sorry whoops oh, john's gone <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to stay on this screen, unfortunately. So what I'll do is I'll actually go. I'll actually go back here to this other screen here, and there we go. So I, I thought I had that all planned. <laughs> yes, this is live, and you just caught me out. I'm, I'm live, and I managed to mess that up. I flipped too many screens all at once. Huh. Anyway, so look, guys, um, I just wanted to say thank you very much for joining me here on the Space Down Under. If you'd like to know more about the Mars Society Australia or even more information on how to become a member, you know, I've placed links in the description below. So please think about joining the Mars Society Australia. And if you do, you'll actually get one of these very cool embroidered polo tops because I got mine when I joined. So... Look, the other thing you need to remember, guys, as well, is, is if you like this live stream, please remember to like this video and also subscribe to my YouTube channel. You know, liking and subscribing just lets YouTube know to share my channel with more people so they can learn about the space down under and what's happening in the Australian space industry. Because I'm going to be here chatting about it for, in perpetuity forevermore until people get sick of me. <laughs> Even then, I'll still be doing it. So, look, I'm always going to be here. Um, so, yeah, please remember to like this video please remember to subscribe if you want some cool merchandise of, of from the space down under um, don't forget i have my own range so that's shop.doshkegan.com 
you can also find me find the space down under on reddit and now on linkedin um and i'm still trying to work that out uh just to let you guys know as well there's been one small development um i actually have an intern who'll be who'll be joining me um and they may be actually be joining me for some of these live streams and things like that and that is jackson thomas he's a high school student at the moment and he's got very strong ambitions to enter the, into the australian space industry so jackson is one of those people and tomorrow um if you're in Brisbane, please join me. I'm the will be the host of a meetup for um, To the Stars, which is a story all about the um, all about Gilmore Space and the ambitions of both Adam and James Gilmore. Um, and look, I'll be attending. I'll be also hosting a meetup, so you can join me um, as well um, there at the end. So look, everybody, thanks very much for for coming. Thanks very much for staying here with me until the very very end. Look and remember. Stay caffeinated.